Okay, so this is going to be the, uh, the third and sort of final part, although it's not really a conclusion as much as it's, uh, I want to think of this as looking at uh, the trajectory of this kind of information. Uh, where we started with um, the revelations for John Dee and Edward Kelly of the Enochian system in and of itself, and then it kind of ends with the Book of Thoth, and I like to think of these things in terms of cause and effect. Um, I've talked before about how the reason that uh, these intelligences and these angels are able to manipulate reality the way that they do is because they exist outside of time. So for them, in a sense, an event can be looked at and manipulated as an object, from cause to effect as a single thing that they can work with. And this is, uh, this is very relevant to the Book of Thoth because, uh, in a sense, it is a continuation of what the Enochian angels were trying to do when they first gave Dee and Kelly this system. Uh, the grimoric system of magic that Dee had access to before this happened was sort of scattered. The spellings were all over the place. Um, different angels had different spellings and different names and different texts. Uh, they had slightly different roles in different texts. And there was no sort of ratification of this grimoric system. So what the angels were trying to do, in a sense, was give Dee and Kelly a single ratified system through which they could um, sort of have a definite way of looking at this and not just sort of compare this grimoire to that grimoire and which one do we use and how does it work and so on and so forth. This is exactly what Crowley was trying to do with the Book of Thoth. Uh, he wrote it at the very end of his life. Uh, it's one of the last big things that he did. And in a sense, he was trying to take the work that he did with the Book of the Law with Libra 418, with the Paris working, and uh, with the Book of Lies and Libra Aleph. Those are sort of the big, those are the works that he will be continually referencing throughout uh, the Book of Thought. Um, and make it into a system, and to systemize it, he used the tarot as a point of reference. Um, this is significant not just because, I mean, the tarot is obviously like a big deal in the Golden Dawn. Um, it was how, according to Crowley, Eliphas Levy sort of organized his doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic. It's how Crowley himself organized magic and theory and practice. Um, what he describes it as is the skeleton on which he based his whole system, which is interesting when you consider that he took so long to write the Book of Thoth because he was writing a lot about ceremonial magic before, and this was his first book on the tarot, which was sort of a, the fundamental of what he was doing. Um, and so the fact that he would do that at the end of his career is significant because this works where he's trying to put everything together and make it all make sense. Um, I've mentioned before that uh, the Book of Thought was actually my first Crowley book, and I do recommend it for people who are first starting um, out into the Lima or in ceremonial magic. It's not going to make a lot of sense when you first read it, but if you stop and look up all the things that don't make sense, if you check the references and look for the context of the quotes that he uses from his other works, then it will very quickly elucidate what he's trying to say with the Lima and what he's trying to say about ceremonial magic. Um, so in a sense we can see the Book of Thoughts as a fruition of the Enochian Angels' original work because they were trying to come up with a sort of systemized way of engaging the occult and this is a continuation of that. Um, in a sense, Crowley's trying to narrow the focus of his work and strip away the wheat from a chaff and come up with something that's going to say uh, the most significant revelations that he's had in, uh, in Thelema and in the occult in general. So, uh, in order to sort of get a sense of where we are here, I want to go back a little bit and look at the timeline. The uh, initiating event of this sort of cause-effect relationship uh, isn't, actually came before Dee and Kelly. Uh, we have to go back to Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. Before Luther, there was a sort of spiritual hegemony in, in Western uh, thought which was formed by the Catholic Church. Uh, the Catholics sort of had a, their war with the Gnostics in the very early uh, days of Christianity, and the Catholics won basically because they got Rome on their side and uh, Christianity became a political vehicle as opposed to more of a spiritual experience. And it was sort of their way of not just conquering other places, uh, but replacing their religions with a single religion, which then came to sort of dominate uh, what was pre what preexisted before, which was a wide variety of pagan thought, which had sort of different ideas, and that influenced Christianity in and of itself and its development of Christianity through Catholicism. But uh, Catholicism is significant because the Church essentially tells you what the Bible means. There's no room for individual inter interpretation, and that was the significant part of the Protestant Reformation. Was Luther was saying, no, we should read the Bible ourselves and try to understand it ourselves, as opposed to just listening to what 
priests are telling us, and that was a big deal. And in a sense, between Luther and in England, Henry, Henry VIII, although he adopted uh, Anglicanism, or sort of created Anglicanism for more personal political reasons, still, what you had was a separation from the Catholic Church. That spiritual hegemony was broken, and um, the authority of the Church was broken. Authority is really important, uh, in, in these, especially in the occult. And in these talks before, we've talked about how to you know, evoke a demon or an angel or an elemental spirit. We make an appeal to the higher authority. What's the controlling angel of that demon? What, uh, what, sort of, what god name is that angel associated that so we call on that name of God to uh, evoke or manipulate that angel or try to command them to do the things that we want them to do? Or the elemental spirits, what domain do they belong to? Again, we appeal to that authority. Uh, in Thelema, the individual is the sole autark of the system. So we are essentially appealing to our own true will as the highest authority, but still, you still have to use the system that uh, the occult, uh, whatever trying to thing that you're trying to do, uh, appeals to. And I think that I think that there's sort of a current of thought in Thelema that um, you just sort of intuitively somehow know what your true will is, and you can appeal to that at any time, and that's just not true. Uh, it takes a lot of work to get to the point where you actually understand your true will intimately enough to be able to make that appeal to that authority and know that what you're calling on is actually your true will and not just something you happen to want at the time or think that you need at the time or something like that. Um, that, takes, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of magical work and study and practice and the diligent keeping of diaries, etc., etc. Um, but even when you do have that, it's still good to make these appeals to authority. So, what I would say is before this, if the angels wanted to talk to someone, they're sort of stuck with the church, um, because that is the hegemony that and that is that was the the existing spiritual authority. When that got broken by the Protestant Re Reformation, it gave them room to wiggle around and start to make contact with uh, with other people. It's significant that uh, the Golden Dawn Papers sort of came out of the Germanic countries where Protestantism started. It's significant that uh, D and Kelly were. A political, well, D was a political force in England short, very shortly after uh, Henry VIII sort of started the Anglican Church, and he was close with Queen Elizabeth, so, and who was de, fa de facto the head of that church at the time. So he was in a position of spiritual authority. It's also fairly unimaginable that D would have been able to practice any of the things that he did in a, in a Catholic country and get away with it in the way that he did in, uh, in England at that time. Because he, did, he was brought before courts, he was accused of witchcraft, and he was able to successfully defend himself against those accusations by claiming that he was doing God's work, essentially, which is not something that would have flown in a Catholic country unless he was part of the priesthood himself. Um, so, essentially, that happened in the early 16th century with Luther and Henry VIII. Uh, it was 1564 in the summer where D got, got the keys uh, and the watchtowers from the angels. Uh, less than a hundred years later, so it was a pretty immediate connection. And Dee himself um, had the mind to handle something like this. He had the mathematical knowledge, he had the geometrical knowledge, and he had the knowledge of the history of the occult and, and history and politics in general to be able to use this information, because it's very important to remember the Enochian angels gave him this system as a means of manifesting the apocalypse, but not just that, but it has the, the, the they strongly say that this can, you know, be used as a political tool. You can raise up kings, tear down kings. You can raise up countries, tear get down countries. It's, uh, if, if used correctly, and to my knowledge, I don't know anyone who has been able to successfully use the system in this way, but the angels say that it can be used in this way, so I think that uh, it's important to try or try to figure that out, particularly in a time where I think a lot of people are very disaffected with um, the current political state and very few people have any idea how they can affect it or what they can do about it. We know that protests don't work. We know that joining Facebook groups don't work. We know that writing our politicians don't work, uh, doesn't work. Uh, the, the, the traditional methods of affecting political change are kind of stymied. Not because we are suffering from a single tyrant ruling over all of us, because then it would be easy, then you get rid of the tyrant. We're suffering from a bureaucracy where the tiny mistakes of a thousand different people, the tiny, selfish, petty desires of a thousand different people are affecting this. You can move, remove one of these people it's not going to 